Hello, everyone. How are you today? Um, thanks for joining us on our discussion where we're going to really dive into some of the leading compliance frameworks that are um, out there on the market today and how they best align with cloud security, namely inside of Microsoft um, Azure, but also what you can do beyond those, those compliance frameworks to better secure your cloud workloads. My name is Chris Doremus. I'm the VP of Technology here at Rapid7. Uh, I'm joined by my colleague, Alex. Um, Alex, let's you go ahead and introduce yourself. Yeah, hi, I'm uh, Alex Korsdorfen, a lead security, cloud security solutions engineer for uh, Rapid7. Awesome, well, thank you, Alex. Um, so really, I think to tee things up, maybe we can start on what are some of the more popular compliance frameworks that you've seen out there working in the field with both enterprise customers, mature mid-market customers, who are not only working inside of Microsoft, but also other clouds like AWS and uh, Google, to name a few. Yeah, yeah, I think there's a couple of different directions with that. I think you're always going to see industry-specific frameworks being applied to industry-specific companies. You know, your your healthcare's and, and PCI's for you know finance and, and all of those sorts of things. But I think overall, one of the things I'm seeing is that there are two overarching frameworks that pretty much everybody is trying to adhere to whether or not they're even regulated at all. Uh, the first one um, historically has always been the CIS frameworks. Um, and then the second, and something I've been seeing more over the last maybe year or two um, is NIST really taking off as well. Got it. That's definitely helpful. And I mean, are, do, you, do you find that there are any gaps that maybe CIS doesn't hit on as it pertains to some of the leading CSPs? Yeah, I think it's interesting that there's no perfect answer because these environments seem to, you know, always be just a little bit different. And I think between NIST and CIS, they, they, they have the same problem in opposite directions. CIS is one of the few frameworks that, you know, is actually out there where it's extremely specific. You know, there it's, you should do this. If you're not doing this here, are the steps you should take in order to get that box checked for your compliance. And I think for a lot of people, that's really refreshing because otherwise you end up with the NIST side of things, which is so vague and fluffy that you end up needing to take to take those requirements and kind of interpret it into your own meaning of what that actually means in real execution. Um, but I think on the CIS side, some of its specificity can actually be its downfall as well. Um, you know, not on the, the Azure side, but one of my favorite examples of of this kind of specificity challenge is, you know, one of the classic cloud misconfigurations is exposed S3 buckets on the Amazon side. You should stop doing that. We, that's something that we want to be looking at across the board. CIS doesn't actually mention that you shouldn't have your buckets exposed. They only say that the bucket that stores your cloud trail logs shouldn't be exposed and it doesn't mention anything else. Sure, that's something you should do, but it's also missing this broader picture of, you know, another very important category that needs to come in. And so um, I think beyond that, you know, another one we've been seeing more recently is kind of the latest breach that seems to be getting everybody in the news um, is like Elasticsearch misconfigurations. Oh, yeah. Okay, well, if I'm CIS compliant, I haven't even talked about Elasticsearch. That's another thing that we need to be talking about. And so I think it's an important starting point. But if I think if you just go through CIS and you say, great, I have checked the boxes on here, therefore I'm compliant there's still more gaps than you would probably like um, in your overall security posture. Absolutely. Um, you know, and just, j just to add on to that, I think one of the, one of the items that you have in Microsoft in, in particular that we've seen with our customers is how they force you to deploy your workloads into those resource group containers. Um, it is, it is a nice thing when you talk about auditing your, your cloud posture, uh, mainly because you can really think about it at the application level where in you know Amazon, we've certainly seen a lot of customers who did a lot of lift and shift. So they have multiple apps and workloads kind of sharing the same account. And now when you talk about auditing from a compliance perspective, it can get difficult to pinpoint which applications are most impacted, um, whether you're auditing against you know, NIST, CIS, or, or the like. Um, so beyond maybe some of these compliance frameworks, Alex, have you maybe thought about some of the other cloud native offerings when it, when it comes to securing workloads? Absolutely. I think everybody's got a couple of different answers of how, how you can do security. And I think some combination between all of them is really where the best answer lies. And I think that answer is going to vary based on size and complexity of, of your company and overall cloud. Um, a lot of these tools are fantastic starting points. 
they, you know, they're, again, they're great things to just turn on to get some initial visibility, not just on the config side, but the, the threat detection and kind of event side. Um, and so I, I see most people going that way initially. I think the follow-up challenge is you always need to um, be kind of taking a half step back and looking and saying, okay, when do I outgrow this? Because there's an inflection point for every tool, for every company where the constraints stop to make sense and just throwing more man hours stop making sense as well. And in which case, then you're going to need to kind of move to the next level of, um, of how you secure these environments. Absolutely. And, you know, from like a budget perspective, security is never free. It's, it's certainly something you want to plan for, whether you're, you know, doing this on, on your own using homebrew tooling, there's lots of open source tools out there to help in the, you know, cl cloud security posture management space, as well as the compliance space, whether you're using cloud native offerings. Um, this, this is not an inexpensive problem to, to solve. So definitely budget as part of your, you know, cloud, cloud journey on, so, you know, security being a first class of this and it's something that you really want to continuously evaluate. You know, one, one of the things, Alex, I'm also kind of curious on is, um, you know, do we ever see the pace of innovation within these clouds um, cause issues as it pertains to these compliance frameworks? It seems like, you know, Microsoft and Amazon are all releasing, you know, dozens of services a quarter. I suspect we'll see at least a few dozen at, at Ignite this year. Um, what, what are some of the challenges involved with kind of leveraging these frameworks against the, the innovation that the clouds put out themselves? Yeah, the challenge is just, it's so hard. Um, it, it, it's just so hard and you're never done. You know, we could, again, you know, coming into last week, you could have 100% coverage on every single service. And then now this week, new services come out. We've got new, new problems to solve, new threat vectors that have, you know, been created through new features. And um, it, it's just a never ending battle. And I think with that too, um, you know, something that we've seen is that there's no perfect answer. Whether we're doing something completely homegrown, we've got man hours that now need to be, you know, poured into developing new, uh, you know, updates to our solution. I think the native tools can even lag behind as well because, you know, internal teams, uh, you know, for these cloud providers, um, you know, they're dealing with the same struggle. They might get a little bit of heads up on new services coming down the pipe, but it's still work that needs to be done. Um, and same thing for, you know, third-party security solutions. Um, every, everybody's dealing with this. And it's an exciting problem to have because the, the pace of innovation on these providers is so high. Um, but getting the coverage initially is hard. And then I think kind of coming back to the compliance piece that we've been talking about, these compliance frameworks and, and the requirements and standards that you were trying to adhere to can't be static because the challenges that people are looking at last year, six months ago, as far as where their gaps are and where their biggest issues might lie are already out of date from what we're checking for today. That's a fantastic point. Now, one of, one of the strategies that we see a lot of our um, customers employ is you know, don't allow your development teams to just use these services day one take them in internally, audit them, understand them. If you have to get custom controls around them before you green light them for use across the organization. Otherwise you will never really keep up. You'll be playing whack-a-mole. Um, and so even though the innovation is great and you want to use that for your next, you know, killer app or killer, you know, killer workload, or you want to reduce spend by, by, by moving over to that, maybe just slow down a little bit and kind of understand what you're getting yourself into from a, from a compliance perspective. Um, so, you know, in terms of maybe operationally, you know, what's, what, what is the best way from your perspective to kind of operationalize the, these standards? Yeah, I think, I think there's a couple things. I think first off, best case scenario is you get ahead of this. Um, something we're seeing more, but still not as much as I, I would personally like is, is people are trying to get ahead of these problems before they exist. Hey, I'm just getting into the cloud it feels like I'm looking over the edge of a cliff. I know that this is going to be a problem. How do I set myself up for success um, for the problems that I know are coming? That's best case scenario. Unfortunately, that just, you know, through many different reasons, that's a lot of times not the reality that, that a lot of our customers get to work in. And so I think for, for existing environments that we're trying to, trying to secure, trying to align to these different frameworks, Kind of a crawl, walk, run approach is, is really, I think, the, the best path to success. 
you're not going to be able to do this all in one day. It's always going to be an ongoing challenge. And I think if you kind of gear up for, for an ongoing evolution, it's, um, it's going to be the best path forward. So uh, again, coming back to say CIS, step one, just notify, you know, get, get all the information together, define good or bad, and just start to shine some light on, on what's the current state of things. So many times people can assume they're out of compliance just because they don't really know what's going on, but they don't truly know because you know, cloud sprawl is such a real thing. From there, once we understand you know, what's good and maybe what's bad, from there, then we want to start remediating you know, all these different issues, hopefully getting us to zero. And then from there, kind of the, the, the end goal and kind of best case scenarios to then start to, to automate and enforce some of these things so that I've defined good, I've gotten everything in a nice state, but then I can actually keep it that way as opposed to just having to kind of reset my security back to zero every time I do a monthly, quarterly, yearly audit. Definitely. And, you know, and, and in terms of automation, one of the things we like to tell our customers is, you know, not all automations have to be invasive or destructive. You know, you can use, you know, knackles and, you know, IM policies to lock access down to these resources where you think they are problematic. And that way you're not actually losing the data. You've just kind of, you know, temporarily halted access to it. Um, also, we recommend, you know, don't necessarily start with automation across everything that's out there in the cloud. Start with just the net new resources. And so the impact is, is going to be far less because these resources aren't yet used in, in production. Um, you know, versus ones that have been out there for six months, 12 months, which, which could have a much larger impact if you get the automation wrong. Yeah. I think that the follow-up piece too, is that not all, not all automation is the same. I, th I think a lot of times when we talk with automation, people immediately jump to the, the doom and gloom side. It's killing VMs that, you know, aren't tagged properly. It's, you know, uh, quarantining exposed, exposed blobs. You know, it's the very aggressive sort of things, which, are definitely you know, a part of improving security, but I think are, are understandably also scary because there's such an opportunity to break things and create more problems than you solve. I, I think there, there's, there's a frequently ignored middle ground on automation that more companies can give value out of that um, you know, it's kind of security, but also almost like housekeeping. Um, you know, what about just automation for things like applying a tag where there isn't one or turning on logging? Um, or just cleaning up orphaned resources that haven't been touched in you know X amount of time. Those sorts of things can improve security. They also help you know frequently with cost. They improve the tidiness of your environment, and they're also saving someone's time on going and doing those frequently repetitive tasks. So instead, those folks can now be working on those more critical and higher severity issues that actually need hands-on keyboard. Totally, that's great. What, what do you think in terms of shifting left? I mean, we, we always hear this a lot. Everyone's trying to kind of do this now. We're trying to catch these things before they happen. How, how can you solve for that, that problem relative to these frameworks? And also, what, what can you do to help better educate the folks further downstream? Yeah. Yeah. I, getting existing environments locked down and secure should be your number one priority because this is where the problems exist today. And again, that's you know where if you get popped, bad stuff happens. But especially as we're seeing you know, more and more companies um, moving towards an infrastructure as code model with your ARM templates and Terraform and all of those sorts of things, these companies essentially have text documents that say how their environment is going to be configured before it becomes a problem. And so with that, there's a massive opportunity to, to analyze these, these different templates to define good or bad and solve these problems so much earlier upstream. With that, not only now are we deploying more secure code because we're not deploying bad templates, we find the problem, go back, fix it, wash, rinse, repeat. Um, but yeah, but then we're also saving time in that process too. So it's just generally a better, a better way to do things. And I think kind of the last piece with it is once it's deployed, once this problem kind of exists, a lot of times that falls into security, cloud security sort of team and, and the developers are, are maybe less involved. When you're moving that shifting left, if you will, um, you know earlier um, on in the process, then you know the developers are more hands-on. That's you know they they haven't walked away from that release yet, and so um, we can start to drive education earlier um, to hopefully for, prevent these problems from happening in the first place. Uh, I'd argue that 
you know, ninety percent of these misconfigurations are not, uh, you know, not out of malice, but out of of just lack of knowledge, either of the configurations and their impact, or how that configuration actually aligns or doesn't align with the you know different companies' uh, policies. Absolutely, that's great. Um, you know, one one other point from my perspective that you know I, I've certainly seen is forming that cloud center of excellence. I I, I think it ties into all of these. Um, you know, bullet points we've, we've, we've gone through today, being, being able to tie this back at an organizational level and really determine how you're doing at the business unit level or for different accounts based on ownership. Um, you know, some, some folks even kind of gamify this a bit. I mean, you need to bring a lot of people together. Um, this is not something that just one or two people can do part, part time. This is something that it kind of takes a village to go and go and tackle this one. And it's, it's something you have to meet on continuously um, to just ensure that you are adhering to the company's evolving standards. Because I think you really hit, hit on it earlier. What you're auditing against today is definitely not going to be the same as you're doing a month from now, a quarter from now, and especially not a year from now. Um, well, Alex, this has been, this has been great. Um, any, any kind of closing remarks you would like to make before we release folks back into the rest of the Ignite conference? Uh, I think I'll just uh, reiterate, it takes a village and something you need to stay on. Um, this is not something that uh, that ages well. And so uh, get on it as, as early as possible and aggressively as possible because uh, it's uh, always harder to change the tires on a moving car. Absolutely. Well, great. Well, thanks for your time today. And uh, thanks for everyone watching. Take care. Thanks, everyone.